Bueno, ezagutu ditu, ez da, gaur eguneko elburuak eta funtsa zeintzuk izango diren, e, egun mamitsua dugu, aurrean beraz e, ekin dizaiogun, ez, mami horri eta azterketa horri. Vamos a comenzar este seminario internacional dando una visión general de los eh, principales retos de las eh, políticas de atención en las regiones europeas, de la mano de la profesora Bárbara Darroit. Eh, ella es eh, profesora titular de la Universidad de Cafoscari de Venecia, miembro del Comité Científico de la CTC. Su investigación, integrada en estudios comparativos de bienestar, se centra en la relación entre los cambios en las políticas sociales y en las prácticas sociales, con un interés específico en el campo de la atención a las personas mayores y también a, los, a las personas de edad más temprana o más pequeña, ¿no? a los niños y niñas. Irekiera Itzaldia, Darroite Anderearen Escu y Sankoda, Honetan joera, que berrikuntzak eta jaurdunbide egokiak aurkeztu ondoren, Barbara Darroitek gogo eta bat proposatuko digu. Altaketarako aukerari eta erresistentziari buru zain zuzen ere. Eta zainketen arloko erreforma eta berrikuntzen testinguru ez instituzional ez berdinen arteko interakzioari buruz ere. Ez dira, hitz makalak beraz, eta hitza luzatu nahi diot e, Darroit, Andere Ari, profesora Darroit, cuando quiera, le cedo la palabra. Oh. <risa> Voy a hacer mi presentación en, en inglés. Uh, lo siento, pero mi castellano no es, no es bastante bueno. <risa> so, thank you very much for this, for this um, very kind invitation. I'm very happy to be here and to be able to talk about the challenges for care policies in the regions of Europe. Um, I'm afraid I will have to go a few step backs in the past in order to Uh, present uh, my main uh, arguments, and, and that's because I think that what is going on now uh, really is very much linked to uh, things that happened around the 90s in uh, uh, European countries. So I think it's very uh, important to have uh, a background on that. Um, let me see which one it is. Yes. Um, so, my talk is about care policies, um, and what care is, is a very complicated thing. Uh, we take it for granted in, uh, in many cases, in many situations, we talk about care as if we knew what it was, but it's very diverse, it's very complicated, it, it has changed over time. What we call care now was not care 20 years ago, 40 years ago, 60 years ago. And what care is in the Netherlands is not the same as care in Italy or in Portugal or in Spain. Um, and one reason for this or linked to this is the fact that um, care policies are a relatively recent and only and partly on, sorry and only partly institutionalized field. Um, we talk about child care now, we talk about long-term care now, but uh, these are so-called new risks which emerged actually, uh, as I said, in many European countries, in most European countries, only starting in the 90s, whereas only few countries, especially the Nordic countries and with other few exceptions, had care policies before. So it's a new field Um, and it's also a field very, made very complex by the fact that we do not have just one care policy. We have care services, we have care services of different types, we have time regulations and these regulations may concern the time of those services or they may concern the time of 
work for people who need those services. Um, and it's not only time, it's only cash. It's, only, it's also money. It's, um, it's benefits that people get. So the ways in which different societies provide care goes through different channels and that makes it very complex. It makes the, the comparison also very complex, complex because what is really important in order to understand how a system works is the system. So it's the combination of different things. When we, uh, for instance, we know that there is this traditional Nordic model in childcare. But the tra and we usually think about the Nordic model in childcare in terms of uh, service provision, direct service provision, universal, open, accessible, good quality, and so on. It's that, but it's not only that. It's also care leaves designed in certain ways. It's uh, income support, uh, especially for the poor, but not only, also for the middle classes, and so on. So it's the package that makes a difference. And um, these policies, and that makes it even more complicated, are embedded in different areas of social protection. This concerns the differences between countries. So things that in Spain might be covered by social assistance are covered by um, national uh, or institutionalized uh, traditional social security models in other countries. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the different, also within countries there are differences. So some aspects of care policies are covered by the healthcare system. Other aspects are covered by social security and others are covered by social assistance and so on and so forth. So all this makes it's very complicated to uh, talk about care policies and to compare care policies. Uh, and I needed to say this because I'm going to talk about the models <laughs> and it's going to be very abstract. So, you, you, you know, I have to put my hands <laughs> in front uh, of you before uh, being uh, uh, misunderstood in a way. And then there's a second... Um, a specification or something that I would like to say at the beginning, which is the fact that uh, we can look at care policies or care practices by looking at different ways in which societies care. And in general, uh, we tend to think about the differences between formal care, informal care and market care. So formal care is usually meant as professional services, publicly funded, publicly regulated, um, and uh, the providers of this care might be public uh, sector organizations, private for-profit sector organizations, or non-profit non -profit, uh, uh, sector organizations, but within a socially regulated framework and a relatively strong uh, public funding. Then there's the informal care, what we usually refer to as non-professional services, so family members, neighbors, uh, the community, uh, and so on, usually based on reciprocity, but not necessarily unpaid. Sometimes also these uh, forms of care are being remunerated and uh, paid for. And then we have the market, um, and here we have paid workers, which are more or less professionalized. So in the market, I would put uh, organizations that offer um, services, for instance, to children or to older people based on out-of-pocket payments, mm? so not subsidized or little subsidized. But I would also put migrant care workers taking care of older people people at home, which we know is a very important, has been a very important phenomenon in uh, many European countries in, in the past 20 years or so. Um, and sometimes this market care is publicly funded, but through an indirect channel by uh, providing people with money which they can spend uh, in the market. So 
As you can see, the boundaries are sometimes a little bit blurred. It's difficult to draw uh, straight lines. And um, it is also difficult to compare. If, if you say, you know, the market in Italy and the market in the Netherlands, if you think about market in terms of what kind of organizations, it's not the full picture, it's not the full story, because in my understanding, um, social uh, cooperatives, for instance, so non-profit organizations in Italy actually work as market um, actors. Hmm? not only in terms of provision, so if they're not funded by the state, they just ask prices, market prices uh, from uh, clients, but also in terms of um, uh, working relations within uh, these organizations. So the market in Italy is not only the for-profit uh, or the migrant care workers, it's also the cooperatives, whereas non-profit organizations in other contexts, I'm taking the Netherlands, which is a, a country uh, that has a huge non-profit sector, well, non-profit organizations there look much, much more like the public sector because of the high degree of regulation of their uh, possibilities to act in the care sector. So, having said this, there is a very well-known trilemma, especially in care services. We can organize care services based mostly on state um, regulation, redistribution, resources, and so on. We can um, organize uh, state, uh, sorry, um, social, we can organize care socially basically relying on the family and the community, or on the market. Hmm? And each of these solutions, which of course are ideal types of solutions, and in reality it's always a combination of these three, but each solution has um, problems, advantages, pros, cons, uh, which we need to consider. So, typically, the social organization of um, care based on state, on redistribution, on rights, uh, and so on, is linked to a high degree of defamilialization in the sense that families are not obliged to care, and it does not mean that they don't care. In fact, uh, re many researchers show that where defamilialization is higher, families and communities care more and not less. They care in a different way. They don't do things because they are compelled to do so. They do things because they love, they feel obliged, they feel attached, they feel interdependent, and so on. And they do different things. So in the case of older people, they will not bathe their older parent, because there will be a service doing that. But they are there, they keep company, they take care of the emotional well-being, and so on and so forth. So in these countries, there's highly available uh, and accessible publicly regulated services. The market is limited. And care work is an occupational pool and an, institu an, an, uh, an instrument for reconciliation between care and work, in the sense that if there are many childcare facilities, women, because we know that the uh, most of the um, weight of care uh, uh, is on women, women will have two advantages. One, they will be able to conciliate better between their own work and care, and two, they will have more employment opportunities, because those services create an occupational pool. So typically, countries that rely on these services have very high levels of employment among women. Uh, informal care, as I said, is more of a choice. Of course, there are high levels of taxation, high levels of expenditure, so a lot of pressure. Gender equality tends to be stronger. And it's interesting because um, many um, research pieces show that 
that, uh, that the gender equality is stronger, especially because the things that are being done at home are less. It's not because there is a balance, a better balance between men and women. It's not that Scandinavian men are you know, more conscious than uh, Southern European men. It's because there's less to do at home, because a lot of things are being taken out of the home, are being defamilialized. So there is a better balance. And, and this is important, the, the quality of those services tend to be high, and the quality of work in those services tend to be high. Though, so mm, people working in childcare, people working in elder care facilities, in home care for older people, and so on, tend to have good jobs, relatively well paid, relatively regulated, and so on and so forth. And then we have the system based on the family and the community. Here we have familialism, so what we are coming from. In Italy, it's still where we are, in fact. Um, and traditionally, familialism was by default in the sense that the state would say, OK, you take care, we don't mind, fine. Hmm? And in more recent years, it has become a more, a more supported form of familialism. So the state says, OK, in order for you to care, I provide you with some money, some help, some uh, advice, some training, some recognition, and so on. There is a lot of informal care work, limited service development, and therefore also limited employment for women, because they have a harder time conciliating and because there's less jobs available. And also stronger gender inequality. And then we have the market system, and there we have uh, a lot of individual and family responsibility, but that responsibility is being um, solved through the market in terms of provision. So families pay in order to acquire services, in order to purchase uh, services. And these services tend to be of lower uh, or of more variable quality. So you will have the very good services which cost a lot and generally services that cost less because they are of less uh, quality. Um, and care work is highly decommodified. So there are a lot of women employed. Many of these women are employed in the care sector, but these jobs are not of good quality. They are li little paid, little protected, and so on. And this has, of course, consequences on their own well-being, on the quality of the service they provide, and also on the well-being of the families that, to which they belong. So, um, if we take childcare policies in Europe um, until the early 90s and long-term care policies in Europe, so policies for older people, disabled people, um, until the early 90s, in fact, we had hardly any market. We had a sort of continuum between defamilialization and familialization. So some countries developed a, a good, uh, high uh, quantity of uh, service, service provision and other um, benefits. And those are the Nordic countries in the case, in the case of um, long-term care, plus the Netherlands. Um, and Southern Europe was at the opposite side. And uh, continental Europe and the UK were a little bit in between the two models. And in terms of childcare, you had the same, but with countries, some countries uh, located in slightly different positions. So France would stick out of the continental European model and be, more be a little bit closer to the Nordic model uh, for a number of reasons which I cannot go into. Uh, and the Netherlands was much more traditional in the case of, um, of childcare. But I think we can recognize here the very traditional models, which were, I, I say, two, in fact. A lot of services and support, very few services and support, and somewhere in between. As I said at the beginning, the 90s were an extremely important turning point. 
um, both for the care of older people and for the care of children. In the case of older people, the biggest issue was the realization of a new uh, social demographic equilibrium that was or non-equilibrium, I don't know, which was coming up. So the aging of the population be became the object of political debate. Um, and the idea started to spread that uh, with the aging of the population, we would have a lot more people with chronic illnesses and therefore long-term care needs, a lot of family instability as well, uh, decreasing number of children that can take care of uh, older people and that can go out and work and fund uh, the welfare state. So specifically aging um, has become a problem in relation to budgets, to social budgets. This idea of the crisis of the welfare state is largely, well, it's not the only point, but it's one of the, the aging of the population and decreasing fertility is one of the main streamlines of the crisis. And with respect to children, uh, the problematization was different. Uh, it was twofold. On the one hand, um, we had more women in the labor market and therefore new needs for care emerged. Um, and on the other hand, and this is important, there was already in the 90s this idea that children needed more than they used to have in terms of socialization, in terms of early development, early education, and so on. So you see that the two problematizations are different. And the EU um, contributed to constructing the problem in different ways for older people and for uh, children, for elder care and for child care. You know that the European employment strategy has been extremely important in uh, constructing the debate around childcare, particularly, because um, there, there was this uh, idea that we would need to support women entering and staying in the labor market, as well as other groups of workers or potential workers, and childcare was seen as an instrument for that, much less than an instrument for gender equality, for instance. It has been constructed as an instrument for uh, promoting the employment of uh, women. And then um, the papers and the book published by uh, Esping Andersen um, and commissioned by the European Union really boosted this idea of, this, of social investment uh, with the logic of the fact that we should, you know, reinforce the welfare state, not get rid of the welfare state, reinforce it, but by investing in children, by investing in services, early, good quality services for uh, children. And of course, this idea is very much based on, at least at the origin, is very much based on the Nordic model. The, the state model, which I was describing before, is re-elaborated in this social, in, uh, in social investment uh, project uh, proposed by Esping Anderson. And this would also help reducing inequalities and so on, because of course, if you have good, good quality childcare, you have a lot of women in the labor market, a lot of women working in good quality jobs, you have good quality education at very early ages, this reduces the inequalities between uh, children that come from different social, uh, socio-economic backgrounds. All good. So far, so good. So this helped putting the focus of the need to change social policies on children and much less on elder care. Because elder care, well, it's about people who are ill, chronically ill, there's not much we can do besides, you know, accompanying them to uh, the end of their lives. Hmm? So the focus of uh, EU policies has very strongly so far been on uh, childcare. And how did they promote all this? Through the open method of coordination, which means, and also because there is no direct competence of, uh, of the EU on this, which means that the EU has put a very general objective, but without saying to the state, 
how, when, with what instruments, and controlling for which uh, expected and non-expected consequences. So sooner or later, in some countries sooner, in some countries later, we have all come to this idea that we have to invest in children and that we have to invest in childcare and so on. But the way we think of doing it and the way we think we can do it varies greatly. And nobody is looking enough, I think, at the ways in which this is being done. Is this being done through the promotion, the funding, the regulation of good services and good jobs? Or is it done through you know, other forms, more linked to the market, for instance, or more linked to uh, the uh, family? Um, so, this was the national, the, the European debate. What happened in practice in uh, long-term care? Different things depending on the starting point. So in countries where the services and the packages and the provision was already very developed and where the system was uh, defamilialized, we had some cutbacks, more or less, depending on the countries. So less services provided, a lot of deinstitutionalization, so less people in institutional care and more people at home, all, also all the discourses of, about aging in place and so on. There has been a lot of, there has been attempts to re-familialize care. So to say the state cannot do everything, please families do something. This has been more explicit in some cases. In the Netherlands, it has been extremely explicit. They, the government told people, we have to cut back on service provision because it's not good. Because if we provide too many services, families do not feel responsible anymore and so on. So you have to do something and only if you don't manage, we will intervene. The extent to which they managed to cut back, it's still... Uh, under investigation because it's difficult to cut back, but that was the uh, point. And in other Nordic countries, like in Sweden, already in the 90s, services were cut back without saying that they would be cut back. Mm? And there was the introduction of market mechanisms. In familialized, more familialized systems, there was a double trajectory. Countries like France, Germany, and to some extent Spain, tried to uh, exit the familialization route, opening up to new national schemes um, that introduced uh, rights for people, that introduced more resources, and that were always a combination of services and cash. Whereas, in general, in Southern Europe, there was stagnation, um, what they did was subsidize market provision and families tended to turn to the markets, um, for instance, through the migrant care workers. In childcare, the retrenchment, so the cutbacks, were much more limited. Um, there was some adjustments, but basically there was expansion. So it's very different compared to uh, elder care. And there was a little bit of more cash, and similar developments occurred in continental European countries and in uh, southern uh, European countries. So you see it from this data very, very um, clearly. This is the proportion of people in uh, long-term care institutions in different European countries, and you see that the line goes down uh, when uh, it comes to uh, stronger initially stronger uh, countries in terms of defamilialization, and it stays the same or goes up a little bit for the others. And this is home care for uh, older people. It stays there and it grows a little bit where it was very low uh, to begin with. And this is the developments in childcare. It goes on up and up and up. Hmm? And also in Southern Europe, but with a very strong uh, growth of, not of public or publicly regulated services, but with a 
majority of growth of uh, private uh, services with the problems that I was mentioning before. Um, and beyond the changes in service provision, what was a very strong um, emphasis uh, during these years was uh, the idea that we should support informal care. We should help families care. We should help informal caregivers. We should give them money. We should give them training. We should give them recognition. We should give them a little bit more time and so on. And at the same time, there was a push towards market uh, solutions through two channels. On the one hand, the state subsidized market services, as I was saying, but also the families that were being helped through cash re went more into the market. So basically, we have very similar policy ideas in all countries. Again, cost containments, focusing on informal care, accommodating market developments. And this has brought to what colleagues of mine and I have tried to call the defamiliarization through the market. So if we go back to our scheme, um, in blue you have the blue arrow is policies and the red arrow is practices, what happens in reality. Uh, Nordic countries tried to marketize and they introduced uh, market strategies. And that happened to some extent in practice because when, you know, when things are there, it's much, much more difficult to take them away. Um, in, uh, but they also try to familialize. And as I said, it's difficult to say to what extent they managed to do so. So far, we're still studying that. Countries that were more basically on family and communities tried to defamiliarize and they managed a little bit. Service provision did grow, especially with childcare, a little bit less for uh, elder care, but it did happen a little bit. But what happened more strongly and more clearly was a shift to the market by the family funded by the welfare state. So I'm going to uh, approach um, the conclusions. And I think I would like, based on this overview, I would like to offer a few discussion points um, that might be helpful in um, going into the discussion that was introduced uh, before about what kind of model. Hmm? As you said, uh, you don't want, you are not the state model, you are not the market model, you are not the family model. You need to build a new model. Um, so I, I try to contribute some points about this. So, first point, I think there is a problem with the care gap approach. So, in gen what is the care gap approach? Uh, the idea that we have a shortage of care that we have more and more needs and we don't have enough resources. Hmm? I'm not saying that this is not true, but I think we need to look cautiously at that. So what is the care approach? The care approach says we have demographic developments that uh, provide us with uh, aging, chronic illness, declining fertility, and that means more needs. We have socio-economic uh, changes, women's participation in the labor market, longer working careers, so less people available to care. And then we have permanent austerity. It was being said before, uh, this whole discussion about the crisis of the welfare state starts in the, in the 80s, actually, after the 1974 oil crisis. And then we had a number of crises subsequently, and then we had the 2007 crisis, and then we had the pandemic, and now we have the war. So we have been living in this crisis environment for many, many decades now. And of course, the permanent austerity reduces the availability of collective resources for care policies, that's for sure. Uh, or it reduces the possibility to make those resources grow as much as uh, they would need to grow. So this is all true. 
But I think that reasoning only in terms of increasing needs and decreasing resources is not enough. Why? Because this is not a zero-sum game. It's not the case that you take some care and you shift it from the market to uh, the state or from the state to uh, the family or from the family. When a certain way of producing and allocating care is being institutionalized, there is also a change in the meaning of that care, in what is expected. If you take care for older people in, again, Sweden, Denmark, the Netherlands, and so on, it has been strongly professionalized in the past uh, decades. So what is being expected from care is much more different. When I was doing research on migrant care workers in the Netherlands, they could not understand how Italian people, for instance, would allow a, a non-documented, non-trained migrant care worker to be living at home with an older person. It would, it would be unconceivable. So what we mean by care changes. And I think that we have to get rid of this idea that there was a time back then when there was the golden age of uh, care, when families were caring for each other, when uh, older people were at home and they were being taken care of by their families and so on. Historians have shown that that is not the case. I mean, families have always cared and communities have always cared, but they have never done what we do. When you do interviews with uh, caregivers of, uh, of older people now, they tell you that they have to deal with the doctors, with the appointments at the hospital. They have to know everything about what Alzheimer is. They have to learn how to deal with uh, Parkinson uh, um, problems. And they, they, they need themselves, they feel themselves the need to know everything about care. Hmm? Can you imagine 50 years ago what would be being at home and having some kind of chronic disease or illness for an older person and what it would be for their, their relatives to care for him or her? It would be a completely different story. Um, so I think that policies, care policies in general, healthcare policies, care policies, education, and so on, have constructed what we mean now by caregiver. They have constructed what we mean now by a good mother. A good mother now has a lot to do with how their children are doing well in school, for instance. Hmm? Was that a priority 40 years ago? All this puts a lot of stress on the caregivers. And that stress is also the result of the policies that we promote in order to make things better. So I think there is a need to have a political discussion, a social discussion about what kind of care we want and why, and who is going to support that, who is going to sustain that. I think we need to discuss, for instance, the consequences of the medicalization of care on the pressure that we put on informal caregivers, just to give uh, an example. Um, and I think we need to look at not only the quantity of care, but also the quality of care, its content, uh, its accessibility, its the condition of those who care, either informally or formally. And equality, I think it's the gender issue here is really key. We cannot think of just you know, moving care from um, the informal sector done by women to a formal sector done by women. Does that make sense? Don't we want to discuss that? And then I think uh, we need to be very careful with buzzwords. There are a lot of words that are circulating, social investment, deinstitutionalization, active aging, autonomy. All these have, are very powerful. Um, they are being uh, transferred uh, 
through, among others, people like me going to conferences to different places and talking about this. They're being transferred by political institutions. Um, they're being transferred by the EU, by policymakers traveling to other countries to know what they are doing, and so on and so forth. But these concepts are vague enough in order to allow multiple meanings and in order to allow adaptation to the context. And that means that, for instance, deinstitutionalization in the Netherlands, where in the, six, in the 70s, 12% of older people were living in institutions, has one meaning. Deinstitutionalization in Italy, where people, older people living in institutions were, were never more than 2%, is a completely different story. In Italy, it has meant a disaster because it has meant institutions are bad. Whereas probably in Italy, there would be a need for more institutional care and not less. So my um, suggestion is to carefully think about what we mean by those words in context, what it means here and now today to use those words. And finally, I have um, my, my final suggestion is to use this idea of best practices with a lot of caution. Because policy learning, of course, is very important. It's very important that we look outside our you know, uh, country, our society, our community to learn what others are doing. But we need to translate those best practices in our language, in our policy language, in our institutional language. So if you take the most beautiful example of uh, aging in place in Denmark, or the most beautiful childcare approach in uh, Bologna, and you, you say, okay, I want to do that thing because it, it's perfect, you take it to your context and the likelihood that it works is very low, or at least it would probably be uh, more of a um, surprise if it worked. It would be a little bit um, uh, the effects of some, uh, uh, you know, exceptional conditions that it worked. Because what, what makes that best practice best is not only the scheme, the measure itself, but it is the interaction of that scheme with the social institutions and the political institutions of uh, the place. I'm done. I, th I hope I was not too late. Ah, I was perfect. <laughs> Surprisingly enough. Thank you very much. Mia esker, darroite anderea. E, bueno, galderen txanda da orain. Ez dakite zaura, podíamos abrir un turno de, de preguntas o, o de cuestiones que queráis. E, si no sé si alguien, si por favor, e, ha planteado muchas cuestiones, ¿no? Que las ha dejado, pues bueno, pues e, abiertas, digamos, ¿no? E, ciertos temas en los que todos y todas podamos reflexionar, incluso aportar, ¿no? Ahí creo que hay una persona que quiere lanzar alguna cuestión. Voy a preguntar sobre una de esas palabras que se repiten mucho, pero con significados diferentes, eh, que es la idea de la personalización, que es una idea eh, tanto plantada como la atención central a la persona, como, como la idea de la personalización, que en Euskadi se está convirtiendo en un, y en España en un concepto muy utilizado, sobre todo en el ámbito de los cuidados de larga duración a personas mayores. Entonces, eh, quería preguntar, eh, planteado además de formas diferentes la personalización, como un cambio eh, en la idea de que los servicios no se centren tanto en los condicionantes organizativos, sino en las necesidades de las personas, y un cambio en los modelos de atención, que en el ámbito de las residencias es muy claro, 
pero también eh, en la idea de una mayor capacidad de elección, de una mayor capacidad de elección de los servicios o prestaciones que reciben las personas, incluso una mayor capacidad de elección de los proveedores. ¿no? Si es un proveedor público, es un proveedor del sector privado mercantil o es un proveedor del sector privado sin fin de lucro. Y ha habido muchas experiencias eh, los presupuestos personales en Holanda, los pagos directos en el Reino Unido, que igual tienen poco que ver con, con las prestaciones económicas en Italia o en España. Entonces, yo lo que quería preguntar es, sabiendo que la, la respuesta es muy difícil y es muy amplia, esa retórica de la libre elección eh, vinculada a la personalización y a la capacidad de elegir, ¿Qué, bueno, ¿Qué valoración se puede hacer ¿no? de, de los movimientos que ha habido en los distintos países? Eh, ¿Qué valoración se puede hacer de esa lógica de la libre elección y de la personalización? Uh, yes, it's a, uh, it's a very compl complex uh, question and a very important question. This idea of uh, personalization, so tailor-made services on the one hand and choice is, has become one of those buzzwords, actually. <laughs> Um, the origin, I think, um, is as far as long-term care goes, uh, goes back to two issues, two, two lines. One line, you know that older people have never been very strongly represented uh, politically uh, and in terms of the development of um, policies for long-term care, whereas um, the strongest uh, representatives of the users have been the representatives of uh, disabled people. So one uh, line of development of this idea of personalization comes from the movement of uh, the disability movements, starting from the US, then going to the UK, and then coming down. Um, and uh, there was this idea that disabled people should be empowered. Hmm? They should be able to decide for themselves Uh, what kind of care they could get, and so on. Of course, this has been, and it's, it's linked to the whole idea about deinstitutionalization in a very broad sense. Hmm? So it's about empowerment of disabled people. So this is one thing. And with respect to older people, this idea has been imported without translating. Mm -hmm. in the sense that it has been applied more or less automatically to older people, even if we know that when we talk about empowering people with disabilities at old age, it means having the families decide what to do in many cases. Not always, of course, but it involves much more, not individual decision-making, but family decision-making. But that's one stream. The other stream uh, of development of this is uh, the... I would say with a very general word, which I don't like, but so that it's clear, the neoliberal um, trends and the uh, new public management trends of the 90s, starting from the 90s, where uh, government started to say that the, best the most efficient way to organize services was to ask users to decide which services so that they could get more quality with less prices. And these two came to a synthesis in the idea of personalization through choice. Mm? Uh, first, personalization means, as you said, um, that services should be more based on demand than on supply, so no against the bureaucracy, against professionalism in some cases. And second, people should be able to choose. As, as I said, all this happened in Europe, first in the UK and in the Netherlands, and then it went a little bit to the Nordic countries, and then it came down. As with other things, what happened, and so if you look at Italy now, it's impossible to talk about uh, service provision for older people without talking about personalization and tailor-made and choice. Hmm? But they don't have anything to choose between. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. because the system does not allow any choice. So I think that's, um, yeah, I, I don't know if I answered, but. No sé si alguna otra persona quiere plantear alguna otra línea de reflexión, aportar algo. No, pues, bueno, muchísimas gracias, profesora Darroit.